So in our last video, I talked a little bit about the idea of a gender binary and sort of um, how elite discourses around gender function in that way. In this one, I'm going to talk a little bit about content um, in terms of what those ideas look like and how um, ideas about like what those ideas, what, what will we generally place in those categories of sort of what it means to for masculinity and femininity. Femininity. Um, these are absolutely culturally defined. There are lots of places in the world where ideas about masculinity are different, um, ideas about femininity are different. Um, you get lots of sort of examples in this sort of space. But um, when we talk about hegemonic masculinity, typically we're talking about an idea that is in large part an expression of power in the outside world. So hegemonic masculinity becomes about height um, and sort of some physical prowess, so muscul musculature and that kind of thing is part of it. Um, we all are also talking about the access to and use of economic power. Specific, so, so generally speaking, masculinity is connected to sort of competition and the, the achievement specifically of financial wealth and income in that sort of space. Um, there's also sort of a relationship to women that is built into that idea of hegemonic masculinity in terms of um, sexual conquest and sort of successful sexual relationships with women that become an important part of that expression of masculinity. Um, and that's sort of the, the positive content in terms of what you actually do. Um, another really important part of understanding hegemonic masculinity is all about what you don't do. Um, what you are not associated with. And so in a lot of ways, hegemonic masculinity and the ideas of what sort of get built into hegemonic masculinity have a lot to do with not ever being associated with femininity, um, not being ever associated with qualities of, of soft, of nurturing, of caring, of expressive, whatever that is. Um, we'll get into some of that sort of stuff a little bit later on, but it's important to understand that in some ways hegemonic masculinity is a more exclusive category in that you can have a lot of money and be really tall, but if you express yourself as nurturing and caring, then you're not perceived as masculine. Um, whereas women have some, in some ways anyway, a certain greater degree of flexibility in that they can maintain their statuses as women um, and sort of as being acceptable examples of femininity even while they are pursuing things that might otherwise be seen as sort of masculine activities. So for example, women can, if they wish to, pursue um, sort of high, highly remunerated posts. They can pursue sort of corporate and financial success without losing their identities as women. Whereas for men to sort of, in this, in this elite discourse of hegemonic masculinity, um, it's quite challenging for men to sort of say, well, you know what, I think I've made enough money, I really just want to hang out and spend time with my toddler. Um, that's a much more difficult position for men to take because hegemonic masculinity has this sort of exclusive piece. Um, and that means that some of the, like, the acceptable behavior for men exists in a really narrow band. Um, there is also a narrow band for women. It's just that it is narrow in different places and for different sort of aspects of this. Um, Hypermasculinity is sort of all of that stuff taken to an extreme. Um, in the in the next in the last little while, you see this a lot in movies, um, and this is changing. This idea about masculinity has become increasingly extreme. I guess is the way to put it. And the best example that I've ever found to talk about this is um, if you ever want to sort of understand how this has shifted, go look at pictures of Sean Connery playing James Bond you know, in his swimsuit and go look at pictures of Daniel Craig playing James Bond in his swimsuit. And one of the things that you'll see very, very quickly um, is that Daniel Craig's body physically um, is a lot, hmm, it's a much more precise expression of masculinity. If you look at Sean Connery playing James Bond, 
He's got a little bit of a belly. He looks kind of like you look at that as sort of an average person, which is a whole other construct. But you look at that as sort of like a normal average person and you go, OK, I kind of know how I would wind up looking like that. Whereas if you look at Daniel Craig, that expression of masculinity is in a lot of ways much more exacting um, because you look at Daniel Craig in sort of James Bond and you go, oh, no, no, no. If I want to look like that, then I never eat a cheeseburger, never eat this. I'm in the gym three hours. Like that's a very different kind of demand. Um, and that sort of violence um, gets sort of played out in that. And in a lot of ways, that's connected to masculinity being something of a contingent status. So one of the things that happens when we talk about masculinity is that very, very, very few men ever feel like they are really masculine. They don't feel that because of this sort of idea of like, I'm trying to meet this elite discourse. Um, and so that sort of leads people to always be trying to prove that masculinity. And that shows up, for example, in expressions of violence and expressions of sort of sexual conquest and the pursuit of sort of sexual gratification with women. All of those sorts of pieces become a really important part of that. Now, as much as sort of that expression, that experience and that elite discourse of masculinity narrows what is acceptable for men, there are absolutely a whole bunch of them that do exactly the same thing for women. This is not a sort of like a, a gender neutral, like a, this is not an exclusionary sort of situation. Um, and one of the things that sort of happened in like the 1950s, um, coming out of the post-war, coming out of World War II, there's some really important sort of historical shifts that are happening at this point in time. And one of them is that during the Second World War, by and large, women went to work. Women were working in factories and doing paid jobs, largely because there were a significant portion of young men and men in society in general who were overseas fighting wars. And in the 1940s, everyone was fighting this war with an idea in the back of their mind of the Great Depression and the sort of economic suffering that people had experienced. And when everyone came home from war, nobody wanted to go back to that. Nobody wanted to go back to that. And one of the ideas about how you did that was to pursue something called full employment, which was basically an idea that everyone who wants a job should have one, and those jobs should sort of allow you to support family. And that works really well as a concept, except that when all of those soldiers came home, there were large numbers of men coming home, but people were doing their jobs, women were doing their jobs. And so the elite discourse shifts in, 19, in the 1950s sort of around that, trying to convince women to essentially return home and leave the paid workforce in order to allow these sort of returning soldiers to enter the workforce again and sort of pursue that kind of economic growth. Um, at the same time, the cost of living is going up, so eventually women need to do both, but that's a whole other thing. Um, when we start talking about that 1950s period, what you wind up doing is created, what, what winds up happening is they, uh, there is an elite discourse around what they call a cult of domesticity. And they will sort of argue for a distinction between a masculine world of paid work that is harsh and impersonal and difficult to live in, and then this environment of the home, which is nurturing and supportive and all of those sorts of pieces. And when you sort of talk about that and you talk about a gender division where men are in the paid workforce and women are at home, women sort of become cast specifically as the people who maintain and build this idea of home, who create home as like a place of rest and a haven. And that spans a whole lot of stuff, right? Because to create a haven from the outside world in the home, you're talking about keeping everything clean and orderly so you don't have to deal with the mess of the outside world. You're talking about wonderful home cooked meals that feel nourishing rather as a contrast to the sort of draining aspect over there. You're talking about the idea of things always being beautiful and, and lovely and visually attractive comparison to like an ugly outside world and that covers everything from sort of that cleanliness piece to home decor which becomes sort of a very feminized thing but it also sort of becomes sort of a part of women's responsibility to appear themselves to be like beautiful and and sort of to care for their children in that sort of way and this becomes 
really, really important as an idea of femininity. Um, and it sort of gets thrown into all of the women's magazines. There's all of these manuals about how do you actually do this. You can see stuff like you can see women's articles from like the the, the period about things like how do you properly spread floor wax on the, the, the mop pad with a butter knife in order to properly wax your floors. Okay. And there's all of this sort of stuff that gets built into that. Um, we'll talk about this um, a little bit later on in this unit. I just want to say that this model was never accessible to everyone. It was always kind of limited, um, such as it is to uh, relatively wealthy, generally white women. Um, it never really included, like, because aside from anything else, that idea of a cult of domesticity kind of like pulls women out of paid work. And you're not like, the, the idea is, is that the world of work is too harsh and that home is sort of this nurturing space, which is like an idea, except that women of color and poor women have always worked, right? Like they always earned an income because they had to, that's sort of the nature of the work, okay? Um, and in that sort of idea of hegemonic masculinity and cult of domesticity and all of these pieces, um, it's really important to sort of talk about, first of all, how that has changed, um, especially after the advent of the pill um, and sort of the women's reliable access to birth control. Um, ideas about femininity and those sort of models of femininity have kind of shifted a little bit in that less be then that they have become a little less about mothering and nurturing and a little bit more sexualized and a little bit more um, sort of overtly sexual um, in terms of women's sexual expression there's some spaces we could talk about that um, but the other what I really want to talk about in this sort of conversation is that those elite discourses in a lot of ways are what we call heteronormative and that they assume and, and sort of are built around an assumption that men have relationships with women. Um, because in, in many ways, like if you listen to that description about what men are doing and what women are doing, like each of them is only really living in like half of the world that humans occupy. And so in order to sort of bring the world together, you need heterosexual relationships. Um, and when we talk about heteronormativity, we're often talking about the ways that our society kind of like just assumes that you as a woman are going to eventually find, form a relationship with a man. And if you are a man, you are eventually going to form a relationship with a woman. Um, this is built into all of our ideas about like the opposite sex. It's built into all kinds of things, right? Like if you have that sort of model of what men are doing in the workforce, you're also sort of creating this assumption that some person is at home doing all the cooking, doing all the laundry, doing all the cleaning. And that assumption doesn't work if you're dealing with a relationship with two men who are both in the world of work, so no one's taking care of that. Um, but you also see, you like, there's lots of places you can see that idea about heteronormativity. Um, anyone who has expressed a desire never to have children um, will sort of recognize that idea of like, oh, you'll change your mind. Um, or sort of people who, and you'll sort of hear this sort of discussions about people who identify as not being heterosexual, who are told, oh, you just haven't met the right guy yet, you just haven't met the right girl yet. All of those sorts of conversations are really a big part of that idea of heteronormativity um, and the assumption that anyone who is not heterosexual or in a heterosexual relationship needs to justify themselves, whether they are justifying themselves um, sort of to themselves or to other people or both. 